public schools in Jacksonville, Florida, nation's 20th largest school district. Uh, from some of the stories we heard from him last night, I'm not sure which career was more dangerous. <laughs> um, there were uh, a, a lot of uh, conflicts there that, uh, that uh, the General Fryer uh, uh, worked through. Um, and he took over a district that was in actually quite a bit of trouble. A number of failing schools there, literally with F's on them, uh, that he turned around. And uh, uh, I'm not sure which you're prouder of, but there's both a book and, and a newspaper headline. I'll show you the newspaper headline first. Which is Duval School's ecstatic, best grades ever, no F's, uh, <laughs> which, uh, which of course uh, was accomplished uh, under General Fryer's leadership. Um, there were also, for those of us who were academically inclined, uh, there was a, a, a relatively new book about what he accomplished there in, in, um, in Florida, out of a Harvard Education Press by Professor John Sapovitz. John Sapovitz, I always mispronounce it, from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, it's a very interesting um, uh, book about leadership uh, at the district level, uh, which I suspect we'll hear a little bit more about. Um, uh, one last uh, set of comments here. Uh, as I mentioned, two, two weeks ago, we actually did have uh, another individual here from Florida, an academic who had studied the data of uh, Florida about uh, the role of incentives and um, how they imagine. Incentives and competition. He says, we must keep reminding our teachers that this is a global economy. Uh, our kids are competing in an internationally competitive marketplace. And then he recounts a conversation he had with Secretary of Education Rod Page, who listed all the Democrats and Republicans in both the Senate and the House who were for everything from vouchers to charter schools and were certainly supportive of high standards and accountability that apparently no child left behind. This is Gen General Fire speaking to uh, his, super his principals. Uh, and says, like every business, we have to compete for our com customers, so let's get that word out. So the second part of the story, of course, will be how he competed and uh, what he did. And uh, so it's with great honor, a great pleasure, I turn it over to uh, Joe Fryer to Thank talk you about much, our okay. schools and school systems rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> I just ask that you not call me a dump fire pilot because that's redundant. <laughs> uh, however, uh, the, the road to being a superintendent is partially explained by my military career because for my first tour of the Pentagon, I had to have a frontal lobotomy, and after that, you can do just about anything. So uh, I figured I could be a superintendent. Um, actually, uh, first of all, I want to thank Bob and uh, Jay and so many people who have been so kind to. Carol and me here because the hospitality has just been uh, incredible, as it always has been in Arkansas. I've been here a couple of times before, not here in Fayetteville, but uh, when I was commandant of the National War College, we used to take foreign students to uh, the College of the Ozarks, for example, and a lot of business people uh, in that area would host us, and I always found the hospitality wonderful. So having done, trained a lot of principals in Minnesota where they have this tagline, Minnesota Nights, I would suggest that Arkansas could say Arkansas awesome and you might uh, you know, have something that would beat them one time because I, I think you, you really are. Um, now speaking of awesome, it, it's a little awesome when uh, you're a former fighter pilot and you're speaking to a distinguished group of educators. I sort of feel like the fellow who uh, survived the Johnstown flood, I don't know if you've heard about that, but uh, this fellow spent his years after that sort of embellishing that story and telling it to everyone. and. Uh, Eventually he died, of course, and he went to uh, the Pearly Gates and uh, St. Peter met him and said, I'll tell you what, we have a marvelous opportunity here. One time before you get in the Pearly Gates, uh, we let you do one more human kind of thing. What would you like? Anything you want? He said, oh, I'd like to tell the story of how I survived the Johnstown flood to the biggest audience ever. He said, no problem. So the next day they brought him to this large open-air amphitheater. There were people as far as the eye could see big podium and uh, big speakers and all, and just as Pete, St. Peter was introducing him and he began to walk up to the podium, St. Peter leaned over and said, oh, by the way, nobody is here. So, uh, 
You know, when you're speaking to a group of uh, distinguished educators uh, as a dumb fighter pilot, you just have to realize your position, and I hope you understand that. Uh, now, you might not believe that, but I would like to show you some things that uh, hopefully you will believe, and uh, Bob's already talked about a little bit, so let me get to this. Uh, we grade schools in Florida, A through F, just like the children. And uh, when I came to Duval County, we had 12% of our schools that were A and B, and when I left, it was 63% A and B. And uh, we had 92% of our schools C or above, and we were the only large district in the state of Florida that had no F schools, and I have that headline too. It's a great one to say. That's what every superintendent would like to have, of course, in the state of Florida. Um, this was the F ranking of the other large districts in the state of Florida that year. And so that was a, a great accomplishment, not mine, but a team accomplishment. We did this together, and I was very, very proud of the team that I had. Uh, several days after that, and by the way, I didn't know about that uh, immediately. I was up, up in another state training principals, and the person who first called me to tell me was the president of the, youth, the teachers' union to congratulate me for what we had accomplished. I had already left the school district. Um, then, several days later, uh, wife and I were sitting in the, in the den uh, reading the newspaper in the morning and opened it up and there was a two-page spread and it had a report card on our district uh, showing that we had been named the most improved district in the state of Florida. We were the only district with no F schools uh, and a lot of our other accomplishments named by the U.S. Department of Education as one of the two <coughs> largest districts in the country whose magnet programs would be models and so on. That, uh, that advertisement was paid for by the business community and the NAACP. And all of that small print you see around it are the 12,000 names of the employees of the district. Uh, and I thought that was awesome. That, that really was a surprise and uh, something, something that uh, to this day I feel very, very good about. Well, uh, I wanted to show you that so at least you know, dumb fighter pilot or not, uh, I, I have some of them days that allow me to talk to you and hopefully connect with what you're trying to do with education in Arkansas. And I chose as a subject our schools and school systems for rocket science. Well, you know, our critics say oftentimes that it's not. They say, uh, why can't you people get this job done better? This is not rocket science. And the fact is they're right. It's a lot harder than rocket science. Mm -hmm. You know, think about it. If you were to build a rocket, uh, and certainly our country's done that, you would go out and find the finest scientists in the country, PhDs in math and science and engineering, and uh, you would get the best raw materials. You put these people all together. Uh, they would design for a considerable period of time to make sure it was just right. They would test and then, uh, you know, uh, test again, and every time they found a flaw, they would fix it. Um, that isn't anything like what we get to do in public education. We have no control of the raw materials. We often take the newest, least experienced teachers and put them with the most challenging students. Uh, we have a human organization whose design is often far less than optimal, and yet we expect results that are, you know, like what rocket scientists would produce. In fact, far more important, important than producing a rocket, as you know, we're producing the future of this country, including the future rocket scientists. So what I'd like to talk about is not about how you teach teachers down at really the tactical level. I'd like to talk about things that I think have sort of been forgotten. And as I travel around the country and train principals, I found that we're probably the weakest on as one of the reasons that we don't do as well in school systems as we can. And I want to talk about strategic thinking, and I want to talk about systems thinking. And then I'd like to welcome, come on in, who do we have here? Uh, Don Eagles, history. Good to see you. We, are, we need somebody who knows history. Uh, and so, and then the last point I'd like to make is just talk a little about partnerships because I think the university world and actually in the private world of education, uh, in our performance, uh, we can do a lot more partner if we uh, don't let the barriers get in the way. Let me talk about what I mean about strategic thinking, first of all. Um, in education, it is rather <coughs> traditional for us to see more and more resources as the answer uh, to our problems. And we always say we don't have enough. Well, guess what? If you go to business, businessmen never have enough. If you ask any general, he never has enough forces. 
uh, or enough airplanes or enough tanks or whatever it is. Uh, this is a common problem that any CEO or any leader of a large organization has. And I remember reading an op-ed piece once by Thomas Sowell, and he said everywhere he went uh, to give speeches, people would say, what are your solutions? And he would say, there are no solutions, they're just trade-offs. And so strategic thinking, I would propose, and I want to get into this a little bit, is about, about balancing ends, means, and ways. Okay? So let me deal with each of those a little bit so you understand what I'm talking about in education context. Um, how do you pick your goals as either a school or a school system? Uh, how many vision statements have you seen from the school system? Can any of you think of a vision statement and, and kind of repeat it for memory? Anybody out there? Repeat any vision But at least kind of paraphrase what you've seen as vision statements. Anybody? Well, okay, go ahead. Always mentions lifelong learning. There you go, lifelong learning. Okay, how do you measure that? You've produced a lifelong learner. How do you know that? You know, what I'm saying is that um, if you look at really good vision statements, uh, because if you're going to achieve anything in any organizational context, you have to know where you're going. And if, you know, you get in a car, you, you have to know where you're trying to go first. So if where you're going is not very precise, if it's not actionable, it's not measurable, how can you organize a whole group of people around getting there? So I think a vision statement is pretty important. Um, and uh, a lot of the vision statements we have are like that, lifelong learners, great citizens, people who are capable of uh, working in the 21st century, and we go on and on with a lot of fuzz. Um, think of some vision statements that have been out there in, uh, in other arenas that have worked well. You know, uh, when John Kennedy said, we'll put a man on the moon in 10 years after his vision statement, nobody, a lot of scientists didn't believe him. But that was a very strong driving vision under which everything else got organized and people made it happen. Uh, when Jack Welch took over at GE, uh, he said, we're only going to be in businesses in which we can be number one or number two. Immediately, they knew which things to shed and what to focus on to become number one or two in those things. Those are vision statements. No child left behind is really a vision statement. Now, we know that because of different metrics and all of that, it has, and a federal system that it has its flaws. But the fact is that we've made it pretty clear that we don't want to leave children behind, any of them. And we've been doing that for years. Um, and there's no reason that in a school system you can't have a vision statement that is as clear as that. For example, in my school system it was, which really is my company's vision statement, every child should graduate from our school system capable of going to college without the need for remediation. Except for those who are, of course, uh, extremely uh, learning disabled in some way or another, and you can say that in any number of ways. Uh, and you can shoot at that all day, and you can say, as some people did, well, it, look, General, uh, you know, a lot of kids aren't going to go to college. And uh, I would say, yeah, you're right. Which ones are those? Your kids? Or somebody else's kids? Uh, I agree with you, they won't all go to college. But who is to make that choice? Shouldn't they have the choice instead of our making the choice? Uh, so, uh, I was willing to take on people who had that argument just as much as those who think we ought to shove half the kids into technical education. Uh, they'll have that choice, and a good system should provide that. But you've got to start with a vision so that you know uh, what your goals are. And then, of course, you build sub-goals under that. And I don't know how you all do it or teach it, but I had a feeling that uh, most people can't handle more than about five major goals. Three of them ought to be the most important, one ought to be one you die for. And so we had in my district Friars High Five. You know, it was at the centerpiece was of course improving academic achievement, and there were other sub goals that were very <coughs> important in making that happen. You know, uh, safety and uh, discipline in the classroom, building learning communities, and uh, things that related to that to that central goal. Well, okay, we now have the ends uh, at least uh, carved out in a way that we, we can begin the, the journey. How do you balance the means that you have with the ends? And uh, all I would tell you is it's about trade-offs, and that's where we'll get to the problem that I've seen mostly in public education is about the ways rather than the means. You have certain means, and certainly you can do something about the means with more money. Uh, means are your teachers and resources of all sorts, technology, and so on. But it really gets crucial here, and this is where I want to talk about strategic thinking, because when we talk about the ways, we can talk about a lot of other things, processes and concepts, but I just wanted to narrow it down and talk about two, systems and programs. Shortly after I got to my district, people asked me, uh, what was your biggest surprise? 
totally different field than that. What was your biggest surprise when you came to public education? I said, my biggest surprise was uh, the quality of people. It was much higher than I expected. Uh, I didn't find a bunch of adults. I didn't find, as some people thought I would, people who were not capable of doing high quality work. Uh, but I did find that they didn't know how to think strategically. Because they were thinking pro programmatically for the most part. Um, and that's the way you get money in public education. <laughs> you need a program to get the money. Uh, one time a CEO said, hey, John, I've learned one thing about public education. They've got more programs than you can ever put in the alphabet. I said, let me just tell you, a businessman in this community gave us $100,000 a year. He said, I'll give you $100,000 as long as you, every year, as long as you're the superintendent. Uh, and immediately turned it over to his uh, foundation uh, chief who uh, required us to develop a program to get that money. I said, that's the way it always happens. You have to be programmatic. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't merge programs with systems thinking, but it tends to drive you down to the program level rather than the level where we talk about systems, and that's what I'm going to talk about in a minute. So the whole problem here uh, of strategic thinking is how you balance ends, means, and ways, and you do it with it, with uh, within an authorizing environment. Uh, now, that environment can differ greatly, so uh, when you're doing your strategic thinking, you can't just say, well, you know, I can do it just like uh, Superintendent X, Y, or Z, or Principal X, Y, or Z did, because your context is different. You know, I took over a district that was in trouble. Uh, it had about uh, half the kids in free and reduced lunch. It had, uh, oh, almost half the kids a uh, minority, and so we had a large poverty uh, group. A friend of mine, John Dacey, took over Prince George's County, and he had a district in absolute crisis. Uh, he had a whole series of superintendents before him that had been fired or in jail. Uh, he had financial crisis. Uh, he had kids dying uh, left and right. He even had a child who died from a toothache uh, because he couldn't get dental care, and uh, it became sepsis, and the child died. He had a district that was even worse than mine. He couldn't wait. I spent a year building consensus for the strategy that I built to uh, make our district uh, he didn't have that time. He had a different context. But also, affecting your goals, your means, and your ways will be the school board, the union, the parents, policies, and no leader can uh, begin without considering the effect of all of those things. And I like to say that that's all done <coughs> in a leadership space. The good news is, if you're a good leader, you can expand that space. Uh, you can affect the goals. Uh, you know, certainly I didn't accept the goals of my district when I came there. I thought they were fuzzy and useless. Uh, you can affect the means in various ways, either through the legislature, your board, your community, uh, and of course, you have a lot of control uh, over, over the ways that you do things. That's, in short, uh, strategic thinking, and we can come back and talk about that later if you want to. But what I'm saying is, that before you ever begin the process of getting into the weeds and figure out which program you're going to get, eliminate, and how you're going to make teachers better, you better look at this thing from 40,000 feet and think about how you're going to balance these means and ways. Let me give you some examples of what I mean by systems thinking. This is a slide we use in the National Institute for School Leadership. Uh, just one of many. Uh, we have case studies of all sorts, video case studies, case studies. We do lots of things, but it's a slide that we use that will help me talk about what systems thinking is, uh, and it represents elements of what we call a standards-based school system. And so I want to talk about how a leader at the school level or at the district level might look at this uh, to be a systems thinker. Uh, you know, you ought to begin, and, and by the way, one of the first things I would do uh, with principals when we would uh, meet with them is I would say, how many of you have spent many days where you've handled crisis after crisis, discipline problems with kids, teacher problems, parent problems, bus problems, budget problems, you've gone home exhausted, but you felt great because you solved all those problems. Now I'll raise your hands. Now say so you realize not one of those things had anything to do with improving academic achievement. But that is often the life of a principal. And in fact, one of our business partners who spent a couple of years partnering with a principal said, I have discovered that a principal is the gutter on the slope roof of life. You know, they often may become, just as superintendents do, become managers of bureaucracies, maintainers of institutions, but they're really not instructional leaders. What do they have to do? How do they fly up to 40,000 feet every once in a while, I'll use that, I don't know, and see the groundwork in a way that the things that are really important pop out and they can get them in priority order and apply these ways uh, with the means 
needs they have to achieve their goals. <clears throat> well, if you look at a standards-based system, this is one example of systems thinking. You, you, you want to align all of these things, and you want to un, you want to lead your team in developing them and aligning them, and you want to underscore them with professional development. Starting with standards. When I came to my district, for example, I said, you don't have any standards here. And people said, what are you talking about? I've got the Florida Sunshine State standard. I said, well, let me demonstrate something. And I went to an elementary principal's meeting, and I was dreaming this up. And I said, I'm going to have the district uh, staff write a prompt. I don't know if you have, do you have a writing exam in this state? Uh, and it's a write on demand by a prompt. Well, we have that in Florida. I said, I'm going to have the district staff write a prompt. I want all of the elementary students in the 104 elementary schools to write to this prompt. And I want you to have every teacher at each grade level select the paper he or she thinks is good enough. Uh, that not what Thoreau would write, but what you think you would expect for how long the child's going to class. And then I want to take those papers, I want those papers all brought to the principal at grade level. I meet with all first grade teachers, second grade, so on. And select for your school the paper you think is good enough. Boy, the principal's got a big shock because they found out that within their own school they had one teacher getting expecting this and another teacher getting and expecting that. When we compared papers across the district, there were comments like, wow, how do you get that out of first grade? I never could. We had no performance standards. We had content standards. The marriage of those is very, very important. And that has to start with some benchmark examples, and it has to continue with a constant conversation in the district and at the school level uh, in the examination of student work so that everybody begins to get a common understanding of what you expect. And even the best schools I had uh, didn't expect enough. For example, I gave to uh, Dr. Costrell last night, a DVD and uh, Jay, uh, of a great school that I had a filming team film. And that school is an elementary school of 1,250 students. When they started this journey with us, they thought the most they could get out of the kindergarten in writing at the end of kindergarten was one phonetically understandable sentence. They now have kindergartners writing eight pages of narrative. Uh, and I have, you know, on my computer, I can show you some of that. Uh, it's awesome. And they thought that they couldn't get any farther than where they started, and they went well beyond that. So uh, getting in your uh, mind that the real driver has to be standards to which you align everything else is important. So if you haven't examined that uh, at the district level, certainly, and that ought to be the beginning of this uh, journey, but even at the school level, you've got a lot of work to do um, to put together a standards-based system. And next is assessments, because assessments have to align with the standards. We talk a lot about high-stakes assessments, uh, high-stakes tests today. And that seems to dominate the conversation. I find it an interesting conversation. Um, if you read uh, the National Center on Education's uh, piece, Tough Choices for Tough Times, they actually recommend we have tougher tests. They, what are truly examinations, not high stakes sampling tests, but examinations. Uh, now, that's a long way off, and that's a policy thing for people to work in. I'm not in the policy business right now. The fact is that many of the high performing countries, Britain, Singapore, and others, have true examinations that examine all the big ideas and the things that you've been taught and you're expected to be able to put all that together to see if you would reach that level of performance that you expected. Uh, so uh, I always get a kick out of hearing uh, teacher complaints about uh, teaching to the test. If they are teaching the test every day and doing test prep, they're absolutely wrong. Uh, and they shouldn't be. But you certainly wouldn't expect a law school not to teach the bar exam, or a medical school not to teach the medical exam, or an accounting school not to teach the accounting exam. You're going to spend the rest of your life as a professional taking exams that are sort of the, the mark that you must meet in order to uh, show that you've learned what you have to learn. The examination should know, be what you want children to know and be able to do. Uh, so uh, that's one piece of the assessment part. But really not the piece I want to talk about at either the district level or uh, the school level. The one that I think we've neglected the most is formative assessment. If you've studied Black and William, you know they say the formative assessment is the most powerful intervention that you can have, particularly for struggling kids. What is formative assessment and how does it compare to summative assessment? These state tests are all summative assessment. If you go into a school and you ask a teacher, uh, what are your formative assessments? And she says, uh, here are all the quizzes I give, and I put the grades in the gradebook. Putting grades in the gradebook, that's a summative assessment. 
that is not a formative assessment, which really should be the kind of feedback that you're getting from a student and giving back so that you can move that child up in that zone of proximal development that Vygotsky talked about, and I assume all of you educators are quite familiar with. Um, and I say, and I said last night, and we were saying to Jay, this is an art and a science. Uh, and we had an interesting conversation. Jay said, can you teach art? Well, we teach art in our schools, don't we? Uh, and, I, and it brought to my mind this morning a conversation I had with a fellow named David Kelly. Uh, you probably never heard of him, but he runs a company called IDEO. He's got cancer now, and I haven't talked to him in several months. David Kelly, whether you know it or not, a lot of the products you use have been designed by his very creative company, IDEO, whether it's an iPod docking station or David Kelly was the inventor of the mouse for the computer systems. Um, and David Kelly teaches a course in creativity at Stanford, and he and I were talking, and he said, John, most people think that creativity uh, is an inborn kind of thing, and he said, I don't at all, I think you can teach it, and I do teach it at Stanford. Um, and one of the things he said was, and this is interesting for us dealing with Bloom's taxonomy, he said that creativity comes at the synthesis level, and I find even my students at Stanford haven't learned synthesis, they've learned, they've gotten up to analysis, but they haven't gotten synthesis. Einstein was a great synthesizer. So uh, the creativity in our country often comes from that synthesis. Uh, and so what I'm saying is that you can, in some degrees, teach art as well as the science of formative assessment, and there is a lot written out on it. Uh, Stanford's done a lot of research on it. If you read Marzano, his latest book, The Art and Science of Teaching, has a lot about it. I just attended a session with Marzano last week, uh, and I'm a great fan of Marzano's, uh, as well as uh, Grant Wiggins, if you've read any of his uh, work, Understanding by Design. <coughs> Grant Wiggins has a great little exercise uh, that I've used in the NISL, uh, where you ask the audience to take a moment, think about when you learn something, to sew, to cook, to drive, to swim, and where feedback helped you. And what were the characteristics of that feedback? Uh, <coughs> get, give me some bullet points, and then call it out. And if you play this exercise just for about 10 minutes and have people call it out, you'll always get the same kind of list. Well, it was specific to criteria. Uh, it was uh, bite-sized. Uh, it was relevant. It was, uh, you know, things that you know that you need that kind of feedback. And how often do teachers have the techniques of being able to find out where that child is on that zone of process development, and give by questioning or games or all kinds of ways of doing it. Uh, to, to make sure that that formative feedback moves them up to the next level and the next level. And so if there's an area of emphasis, if you're looking at a system, whoops, or you're looking at uh, a, a school itself, and, and you're looking at how all these elements fit together, I would hope that somewhere there's an emphasis on really honing the ability to do a formative assessment. And that does not mean going out and finding a company that does it. One of the biggest flaws I find is that and my district when I left, I mean, the guy who replaced me just spent money on everything. And uh, one of them was hiring a company to do formative assessment for them. Well, if teachers don't want it, you know, it's just another test. So watch out. That's not really what I'm talking about. Curriculum framework has to obviously align with the standards again, and you're aligning all of these. And I'm not going to get too much into curriculum framework today, uh, but whether it's pacing guides or it's... Uh, it, you know, one of the problems is, comes with it, the alignment of these two curricular framework and <coughs> For example, in mathematics in my district, I, uh, I put in a whole new math curriculum. Uh, investigations, connected math, and then the CPM math. And I had a real hard time aligning these two because uh, at the middle school level particularly, we found that it was kind of hard to teach a new math well enough to teach a rigorous curriculum. And that's where we're losing so many kids in mathematics is in the middle school level. We're also actually beginning to bury misconceptions in their minds in the elementary schools because of the lack of knowledge of math. But this alignment becomes a real problem when you get up to, uh, up to the, the, the middle school level. Instructional materials. We have traditionally, I think, let instructional materials drive all of this, rather than being driven by this and aligned with those. Um, textbooks drive far too much in this country. Dr. Bill Schmidt, who is the chief researcher for TIMS in the United States, uh, he will show you the agonizing problem of textbooks. The company I'm with, for example, 
uh, has some wonderful math interventions. One is a whole course for a year, and another is an intervention based on a decade or more of research from the Shell Center in Britain on mathematics misconceptions. And oh, by the way, when we tested in the United States, uh, all of our assessments and misconceptions, we found that teachers missed the same problems as students did. So we know where the misconceptions are coming from. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the fact is that uh, we asked textbook manufacturers, why don't you make textbooks that are more like the textbooks in the countries that we know are outperforming us in math? And they said, well, two reasons. And they're sales reasons. They said, number one, we're trying to, we're trying to produce books for 14,000 school districts in the country. And we, we pretty well understood that answer. The one that surprised us was they said, well, we don't sell to superintendents. We don't sell to principals. We don't sell to even teachers. Really, who do you sell to? Committees. Ah, that's right. We sell to committees. And on that committee will be the skills-based teacher, and there will be the NCTM focal points teacher, who loves to teach the concepts of math and get those connected to problem solving and skills. And we have something in there for all of them. The trouble is, that supports the status quo. If you don't change the problem, you will never change the result. And yet we're letting the skills-based teacher, in. or the one who's off on the other side and doesn't blend skills with concepts, we're letting them continue to do what they're doing. And so uh, the selection of instructional materials is pretty important that it aligns with your curriculum framework, uh, and that it aligns with your standards, but also that you not let it drop. You know, in my district, uh, I, I, I kept emphasizing if you will use the standards as the driver, you can use a wide variety of materials to get to the standard. It doesn't have to be a textbook. And one of the biggest problems we've had in public education for years is depending on a basal textbook, which is assuming that the child's at grade level and a lot of kids can't get there, or they're beyond it. And so this whole thing of differentiated instruction is about how do you provide something for those children at both ends? Uh, and it's not by letting the textbook drive anything. Everything, and also we know we have this model wide deep thing in all of our course materials because of the fact that textbooks tend to drive. Uh, safety nets. We use that term in our country. I don't know if you use it here in Arkansas, but it's um, fairly recent on the horizon. It is how do you provide those nets for children who don't meet the standard? and get them up to standard. One of us talked a little while ago about uh, remediation. We, in our company, don't use the word remediation. We talk about acceleration and intervention. Uh, but uh, the fact is that even when we do remediation or whatever you call it, oftentimes we forget to understand the nature of children because we turn them off when we say, by the time they get to middle school, we're going to go over fractions again. They say, I have already had fractions. You know, I don't need to have fractions. Uh, I know fractions. Um, and for example, our math intervention has a series of modules. And we strategically, for example, look at a child. We know that they collect misconceptions or flawed knowledge as they move up in the grade levels. And so what we're trying to do is go correct and upgrade that flawed knowledge so they can move on to higher level math. And so we give a screener that is designed to find out where that flawed knowledge is and then apply a module that works for that. like. Um, rational numbers in middle school. It's better to call it that than fractions. And uh, it looks like a real math book. It's not a bunch of cartoons that demeans a child that they're being remediated in a subject that they <laughs> already think they had. Uh, but that's a minor point. The key point is you have to have safety nets that are connected to the standards so that you know where the children are behind and that you bring them up to the standards. Now, all of that said, what I'm trying to say is I hope that if you look at school or if you look at the district, that you're thinking as a system. You're saying a standards-based system has all these elements. I can't fix all of those at once. I can't make them 100%. You, you know, this whole business of public education is a journey and not a destination anyway. So it's a continuous effort. But if, uh, you know, I found when I was managing other organizations that um, you get caught in the flurry of, of, of work every day, and it's hard to get up to that 40,000 feet. I always carve out time periodically to just go back and look at the system. Where are we in terms of our major goals and the alignment of all these pieces of the system? Because if your system's thinking, you know that one part's paying over here affects the part's paying over there. And if you don't make it a uh, system, the whole will never be uh, greater than some of the parts. In fact, our company pioneered whole school design. And people say, well, what is that? Well, if you imagine in the IT world a systems integrator coming to you, 
they say, uh, we're going to make all these complicated things you have, technology, work together and seamless. That's what we try to do with schools. Uh, but imagine if that person also brought some of the best parts, like author studies and genre studies, rituals, routines, rubrics, uh, internationally benchmark standards. That's what we do because our company believed from the very beginning that you have to look at a school as a system. And that if you make it work like a Swiss watch, you will get <coughs> better results, no matter what the demographics of the student. Uh, students and uh, so uh, a systems approach is necessary but then how do you keep it going and how do you keep getting deeper and deeper how do you uh, fix those things that you know you have to set priorities right now because maybe it's you really need to focus on the assessment. maybe you need to work focus on standards maybe you're a mile wide in each deep a lot of sta state standards are a mile wide in each deep you know every political entity that puts those together wants their piece of the action in there and so you have people like Doug Reeves saying, you know, you better get down to the power standards, which are the ones that really count. How do you do that? Maybe your effort in your school needs to be working with your teachers to get to, or your district, to the power standards that really count and align with the state test. You'll have to consider that as test specifications. And then how do you define the student work that makes you understand that? We, we actually, who's the AP teacher here? Uh, we do that in, the, in AP. You know what the expectation is for the AP exam, and you can work backwards and look at the student work that's required at various stages to get there. But we don't do it with the whole system. So you may have to just focus on one part, but what I'm saying is your whole professional development system, your whole professional development program in the school or in the district ought to be uh, there, if you're thinking strategically and systemically, to uh, focus on those priority order things that you have set in place to do. And all of this can't be done unless you have teams. I talked about this with someone this morning, about what teams really are. Uh, some of our graduate students here, where's Matthew and uh, yeah, Ryan, okay. Uh, we all talk about teams. Oh, I belong to this team or that team. And yet so often in, in, uh, in bureaucracies, and certainly in education, we're not really on teams. If you want to read about teams, there are only two books you need to read. One is The Wisdom of Teams by Katzenbach, and I can't remember who the other author was, and The Seven Dysfunctions, The Five Dysfunctions of Team. Uh, because they really put it all together, and I can summarize some of it. They describe a J-curve in which you have a working group, then you have a pseudo team, then you have a real team and a high performance team. What's the difference though? Well, if you come together just for a purpose to talk about something and go let maybe a working group uh, solve some problems. <coughs> if you put together a group of people who all come together to work their own interests, that's probably a pseudo team. There are a lot of those. If you get to the real team level and then on the high performance teams, that's where there is a clearly defined performance goal that is owned by the group. Uh, and there is acceptance of group responsibility for the results. That's a big risk. Because when you own the results, you can't escape and say, well, I wasn't in that part, I didn't have anything to do with that. Uh, I just came to find out what I could find out. Um, there, there are a lot of teams around this country in public education, but very few of them are high performance teams, whether it's at school or at a district, but particularly at the school level. The best schools I've found really know uh, what teams are, and that's all built by relationships because those first two things I talked about only come about if you have trust. And so the building of relationships is very, very important. But what I'm saying is you will never get all this to work if you don't support it with teamwork and if it's not guided and directed by a leader. You can, just because I'm talking systems, that's not the only way. That was one example of systems thing. Here's another example at the school level. Uh, Shakti says there are six systems that define a great school, starting with the recruitment and induction system. I, every business I've ever been in, the beginning of success is who you hire <laughs> and what kinds of criteria you use for that and then how you, how you socialize them into the culture of your organization. And so often in schools, we just accept whoever we can, we can get uh, a warm body, uh, or we get people we think could be pretty good and then we assign them to, as a mentor to the uh, most toxic teacher in the school and we expect to change, you know, to have a positive culture in the school. Um, 
the recruitment and induction system is the way you ought to think about it. It's key to the performance of your school. Uh, the knowledge tra and transmission system and the power and authority system uh, are really connected to one another. Schlecki talks about three kinds of systems uh, for power and authority. One's the bureaucratic system. I had an old boss who used to say, uh, here's my wiring diagram. One box up here says me, aligned to another box says everybody else. Uh, <laughs> that's the way prisons work at some high school. Um, but uh, he also describes another one, the AP teacher might remember. Uh, that's the credential system, like doctors and lawyers. If you're the AP teacher, you're a cut above. Uh, if you have some status, you've been there longer. Uh, that's the pecking order system. We see a lot of those in schools. Uh, but what's the best kind of system? It's a system, Schlecki would say, and I agree, yeah, because I've seen it in great schools, in which you get power by what you contribute. And that produces the opportunity to deepen this constantly, because now people are constantly engaged in the process of deeper and deeper learning, which is uh, really building on true learning community. And in Jonathan Sapava's book, in the last chapter, I realize he, he wrote that two years before I finished my superintendency, but this last chapter, if it had a critique of, at all of my leadership, it was we had not yet achieved, and he was right, complete understanding across that district of what a learning community was. Um, and uh, some people thought it was book talks. That is not what a learning community is. It, it, it is much deeper than that, and it's built on the foundation of teaming and on a power and authority system like the one that I mentioned. Uh, we could go on, what's the directional system? The directional system in which, really I would say this last thing says it all, ownership. Uh, in public schools, uh, there is too often uh, a power and authority system that has no ownership by the people who are in the system. And that's where you really get the most results. That's where the union contract doesn't make any difference. When people own what's happening in the school, uh, whether it's the development of standards and really understanding what student work they want, um, or whether it's how they develop the knowledge and deepen it, uh, ownership really erases all the problems in the contract. Teachers do what they have to do because they want to. Uh, old boss of mine used to say, have you ever taken your rental car uh, for a car wash? Anyone ever taken a rental car to a car wash? I haven't. <laughs> uh, if you don't own it, you know, in the Air Force, we put the pilot's name inside the airplane. On that side, we put the crew chief's name. That's his airplane. He owns it. We want him to be proud of that airplane every time the pilot comes out. Ownership is a big thing. Well, all of that said, strategic thinking, systems thinking, let's get back to rocket science. Did government do this all by themselves? Obviously not. Uh, you don't build a rocket that way. Too often, I would suggest, and you can challenge me on it, in the education world, universities do their thing, and superintendents and school systems do their thing, uh, and then private companies go out there and do their thing. Um, I'm suggesting that we could do a lot more than partnership. Sometimes this is tough, whether you look at it from a superintendent university standpoint, or you look at it from uh, a private uh, company standpoint with uh, a university. <coughs> Let me give you some examples of what I mean. When we started the National Institute for Leadership course, we based it on two years of study uh, that was funded by the Carnegie Corporation, uh, looking at leadership institutions all over this country, in the military and business and education, clergy, uh, medicine, all kinds of people, and had some interesting discoveries. For example, as I said this morning to uh, Dr. Green, when, when Jack Welch took over GE and he found that executive leadership was poor, he, uh, he looked at what the universities were doing and he was not very happy with it. So he started his own corporate university and he taught in it himself. Well, the universities got, mm, they figured that out real fast. Hey, these companies have a lot of money, we don't want to lose it. So Harvard now, for example, will spend a million dollars on a course and $800,000 for the online support. A course, I didn't say hiring professors for individual court, uh, individual treatment. I, I, I'm talking about a course. Uh, when uh, Mark Tucker and Judy Cotting surveyed educational institutions around the country, they found the most they could identify that had been spent on a course was $6,000. Why? Well, uh, we don't have to attract our customers for one thing. You know, every state in this union requires for you to be a principal. You either have to have a master's degree in leadership or educational administration. 
So you already you got a customer base to start with. You don't have to work for it. Uh, it's not just those who become principals, it's all those who think they might be principals. And it's amazing, it's the most popular kind of master's degree around. Seems to be a lot more, more attractive than getting a content master's degree, right? Uh, well, the fact is that you don't need to spend millions of dollars. We spent $11 million on the curriculum that we uh, put together for NISL based on looking at business, the military, education, and blending them all. I blended learning systems, case studies of all sorts. Uh, we hired professional actors to do some of our video case studies. We've got incredible um, written case studies. Um, well, we went to Ole Miss, uh, and we said, uh, you know, there's a state grant out there. Uh, the principals. Why don't we do this together? The Dean of the College of Education Ole Miss is Tom Branham, who's been principal, the superintendent, and the state superintendent. He said, that's a great idea. We put forward a proposal that had both of our logos on it, and we won. Uh, and we built from there, and later on, Tom said, you know, I need what you've got invested. I can't invest that million dollars, $11 million. They probably invested $12 million by now. Uh, I can't invest that kind of money. Why don't I license your curriculum for my leadership program? You train my professors, and that's what we did. And it was the most healthy relationship I've ever seen with you. It was just great. Uh, another kind of partnership was with uh, Leslie University uh, and others in Massachusetts, uh, where they said, we like this NISL program. Uh, and I'm, by the way, I don't run NISL anymore, so I'm just telling you a partnership that worked. Uh, they said, we want to build our doctorate around your program and we'll deepen it and we'll use the core elements of your program and we'll go 24 credits toward a doctorate. Why do we want to do that? Well, that's probably get us a lot more doctoral students. All these folks who take your course, because Massachusetts required all the principals of Massachusetts eventually to have this, and that's what they're working for. Pennsylvania, the same thing. Minnesota, the same thing. Uh, why not just build on that? We'll get a lot more people in our doctoral program We'll have a foundation they can build on, and we'll, you know, it could be a win-win. Uh, so that, those are two examples. The work I'm doing right now, uh, later this month, I'm going to go to a local community college and talk about mathematics. Every community college has a challenge, and probably colleges as well, remediating <laughs> these students who come to them who just can't get to the algebra level. And they're stuck with the job. It's now that they're out of the school system. They have to figure a way to get these youngsters through to be able to compete in the college environment. My company has programs that do that. We've spent our lives investing in that. And uh, we have as our partners the Australian Council for Education Research, the co-designer of TIMS and the designer of PISA. They do all our assessment work. We've got a partnership with the Shell Center in Britain, 10 years of research of math misconceptions. We have done a lot of international research ourselves. We know how to fix that problem. And the cost to a university is a pittance. Uh, why go reinvent it yourself? We could have a partnership. And I'm just giving you those as examples of, I think sometimes we get too much in our own boxes and we don't realize that we could uh, partner together and we can go on and on about the problems of partnering at the superintendent's level. I remember inviting a, a group of university professors at one university into my school system to see some really high performing schools. And they said, well, that's all fine and well. I love what you're getting here, but what you're using is a proprietary system. We can't teach that. I said, I'm not asking you to teach a proprietary system. I'm asking you to teach best practices that align with that. Um, and because some, sometimes there's so many barriers to it, you know. And I, I, I went to one university trying to create a partnership with Missile. And the dean told me, well, I love what you have. In fact, she invited me down on a Sunday to brief this. She was so interested. But I got two professors who will block everything I try to do like that because it wasn't invented here. So we need to get over those barriers, I think, and create the partnerships that can work better for kids all the way around. Um, I think we do, even here in Arkansas, we could, uh, since it's Arkansas awesome, we can do some awesome things. <laughs> uh, I hope I've convinced you, even though a lot of this is, you know, a year and a half worth of course. Uh, that strategic thinking is important, no matter what endeavor you're in, running a large institution. We don't do enough of it in public education. And we need to think about systems uh, as the overlay for all of that great work that everybody's doing uh, to try to teach teachers. And that programs are important, but they need to be integrated within the context of the system. Thank you very much, and I'm open to the
the uh, experiment going on in Little Rock or what's going on. I try. I, I did all of those things for the system that I talked about to the degree we could at the time I had as superintendent. Bob's absolutely right. Uh, near the end of my tour, I said, I still got, we've narrowed it down now to six F schools. I want to get rid of those six F schools. Uh, went to a state board of education meeting at which uh, the state board gave all of the superintendents authority to waive the union contract for all the F schools. Um, for the particular A schools that had multiple F schools. Uh, immediately, a member of the press asked me, well, are you going to uh, just walk over the union on this? And I said, I, I never do that. Uh, I'm going to do what I have to do, but the union will, I, I will keep them informed all the way in what I'm doing. And here's what I did. First of all, um, I needed to find out how we change the quality of teachers in those schools. And I realized that it's something I had missed all along. Intuitively, I knew it, we all talk about it, but I hadn't done anything about it. We've had these constant conversations about what work was good enough. We've never had a conversation about what teacher was good enough. And so I brought in, I spent a whole day, I brought in the principals of each of those six schools. I had members of my staff in the meeting who had observed teachers in those schools, only the members of the staff who observed teachers in math and different studies uh, reading. And I had the principals. Uh, I, I gave them an exercise, and I was a scribe. I, I divided the, uh, the blackboard here, and I said, this column is uh, superstars, and this column is the rest. I want you to tell me which teachers belong in which column. And we had a conversation about every teacher in their school. And we'd get, uh, you know, Joe Blokes. Well, he's a parking lot cancer. Oh, really? Uh, he goes over there in the uh, other column, obviously. Well, how about Wanda Smith? Uh, she didn't teach a curriculum. Oh, okay, she goes over there. Uh, Jim Jones, uh, he doesn't really get along with the kids very well. He knows his content, and he belongs over there. And we went through that kind of discussion. I was appalled at how many, and every time I'd say, did you declare that teacher less than satisfactory? No, sir. And you know, out of frustration, I said, why? Well, each year we had a teacher hiring fair where all the principals set up moves in the fairground uh, building, and uh, teachers would come and uh, interview with different principals. And one principal said, sir, nobody ever comes to my group to hire a chair. He said, if I declare all these teachers <coughs> unsatisfactory, what am I left with? Uh, he had a point, and I certainly understood that. Sometimes these uh, schools that have been stigmatized for years uh, have an awfully hard time recruiting people, so that whole recruitment and induction system is a big problem for them. Uh, sometimes you just shut the school down, and I was with the principal in Massachusetts, and he was telling about how he just couldn't get any teachers at this one school anymore. And I said, have you thought about shutting it down? He did. Uh, sometimes you just can't get rid of that stigma. But in this case, I had authority to do something bold. I had already changed the principal as much as I needed to. I had put all of these schools under one set of administrators, and they were sort of a special district. Um, and uh, they belonged to, you know, I gave them a lot of scrutiny and the best administrators I could find. Uh, now I needed to look at teacher quality. And so uh, what, what we did in that exercise was line them all up, and, uh, and sometimes they didn't know what a superstar was. They said, well, this person has, has to grow, but they'll be good. I said, I didn't say somebody needs to grow. They can grow in another school. In this school, they have to be superstar. So we finally got that list. And before I did anything else, I sat down with the union teacher. At the end of that day, and I went over the names of every single one of the teachers we declared not belonging in those schools and each of the schools. She added two names. One of them was a building representative of hers in one of the schools. Uh, so we had that kind of relationship that made it much easier for me. And because I kept her in the, the tent and not outside the tent, you know, she was willing to support me in these things. Then I said, we got a way, we need to get good teachers in these schools. So I had two initiatives to do that and an overarching incentive plan. I told the curriculum instruction, uh, my chief academic officer, I want a bonus plan that nobody's ever seen before. $12,000, I just named it, $12,000. And you figure out how we work that out. If you take accountability for students in one of these schools, uh, that means we're gonna look at the performance of the kids based on your association with those children then uh, how can you earn $12,000? We had a $3,000 signing bonus that you got renewed every year if you were kept at that school. 
you got a opportunity for six thousand dollars on a sliding scale based on the achievement on the state test of the kids assigned to your group of teachers. And then if the whole school went up a letter grade, you got another three thousand uh, dollars. I told the uh, you know the union chief wasn't so sure about that. She was she told me one day, well I'll, I'll put up with that for now, but you know that'll have to go away eventually. Uh, about a month later, she said, you know, we'll have to keep this. <laughs> I said, yeah, I think we will. Um, but in any event, uh, the next thing I did was send a letter to all the principals saying, give me some of your best teachers. Not me. He said, why would they do that? <laughs> because they had already seen the effects of No Child Left Behind, that if you're in a low performance, a failing school, you have the option to go to another school. And guess what? They were getting all these kids from those schools, in their schools, in one school, we had 300 of them transfer. Uh, so wouldn't it be a little better to give that school some of your best teachers than to have all those kids come to your school? You're overcrowded. You didn't want that. You know, you're, you got a great grade level. Now you know you're going to be challenged. So that was a, an OK incentive for a lot of that. Uh, then I also sent out a general letter uh, to the teacher population saying, apply for this job if you're interested. Then we had a meeting with the, the principals, the union chief, and two separate meetings, one with the teachers who were nominated, another with teachers who just applied. And all of them were to be vetted. We, uh, we didn't uh, just you know, let them come. So they had, we had a vetting process. But uh, the union chief got up and gave a speech about how important this was. Uh, each of the principals gave a talk about what was unique about their school and the challenge and what they felt was great about it. And, uh, and we signed up to teach at their school. I did a lot of other things uh, at that time. I said, look, I, truancy is a big problem at all these schools. So I want two dedicated truancy officers at each school with a dedicated vehicle. The first two months, I made over 2,000 visits in home visits in the capability we now have in those schools. Uh, we did a lot of special training for teachers, and I could go on a lot of things. The total cost of everything I did was for six schools, $12 million. Nobody gave me more money. I had to make trade offs in the school system to get that money. We looked at every funding source possible, what we didn't need to do versus what we did need to do. That raised the last six schools we had that year. Um, and so that is an answer, I think, to uh, most of your question, Bob. I've forgotten some of the elements of what we did, but there were a lot of things that were built in this plan um, that uh, proved to be a plan for it. Question. Did teachers hang around at those schools? Mm -hmm. the teacher, uh, is, did teachers stay at those schools then, the ones you brought in? Some did and some didn't. In fact, I, the, the sad sequel to that story is that when I left, and I could, that's a separate story while, while I decided to leave, but I really hadn't intended to leave. Uh, you get to a point where you have to make decisions about your own future, too. And I was getting a lot of offers, and uh, my wife and I had a lot of conversations. Um, my last contract, if you know the life of superintendent of the the district, you fight lots of forces, and I had lots of fights to get where it was. And I knew another contract was coming up within a year. Um, I knew that I still wasn't paid what I asked for when I first came there seven years before. I knew I couldn't even get a, an expense account from the school board the last contract. And I knew I was going to have to put up with all the crazies who came whenever your contract was up for renewal. My wife said, you know, is this why you want to spend the rest of your life? It could be the rest of your life. <laughs> well, he, was, he was very sick. And I had a, an illness for a while that I got over. But nonetheless, uh, all those things came together. And I had not intended to go. But when I left, the board intended really, they, they got it. They, they knew they needed to hire somebody who would build on what we had done. Uh, unfortunately, they hired somebody who didn't. Uh, and, and this is a problem of change of leadership. I, his ego, I think, was part of the problem. The mentality that you just buy programs. He spent $17 million just on the own reading program for uh, middle and high school. Uh, he spent $30 million on all kinds of technology things. My company isn't much into technology things for education. Not that we don't believe technology is important. Every student should graduate capable of using technology, exploring uh, sources on the internet, all that, using spreadsheets, all of that. Blogging, you name it. But when you use it to substitute for teaching, watch out. It's not that it can't augment, but watch out. Because technology programs tend to be skills-based. They don't involve the interaction of students with one another, usually. And they don't change teacher capacity. 
teachers don't really learn more math by the kids sitting on a computer watching a computer program. So, uh, and in fact, there was a report to the Congress uh, this past year by an independent uh, research agency that said it evaluated all these computer-based programs, reading, math, others, and the bottom line on all of them was the effect of these programs was equivalent to zero. Big investment. So any of that, my successor did <coughs> different things, and for a lot of reasons, uh, the, the district actually went down in performance, and sad me, we had a lot of <laughs> agonizing discussions about it. And uh, we've got now, and the superintendent got fired, and after two years, and now this fellow who's been there a long time, and I hope he can put us back on the path where we were wrong. But yes, a lot of the teachers did stay, some didn't, found that it was too tough an environment, you know, how that goes. And uh, the ones who uh, stayed in one of, the, one of the high schools has continued to do pretty well as a result of the leadership of combination with those teachers, and some of the others have done so so. No, they're, they're not all that school. Uh -huh. Could you talk a little bit more about your concern about <coughs> textbooks and um, that when they're, because they are adopted by committees, they have a variety of teaching right. styles. It would seem that might be a good thing since not all teachers have the same strengths <coughs> and not all student populations are the same. That they could choose from these different things. Could you expand on that a little well, bit? I certainly, as I told uh, Sandra last night, I don't want to drive every teacher the same pedagogy. That's <coughs> lots of pedagogies <coughs> across the globe to produce good results. So that's not my point. Uh, but when I chose math curricula, I didn't let a committee figure that out. Because I knew I needed coherence and I needed scaffolding. And the only way I was going to get that is if the math supervisor and I figured out what that should be and we just said this is it. In fact, uh, at the middle school level, because people kept trying to keep their, in fact, even the elementary level, their feet in both camps, finally told the principals to take the books away. <coughs> the books, because they didn't even use the old book. Uh, there are points at which, and I think curriculum really is basically a district responsibility. Uh, and it's not that I won't, don't want teachers to have a say at home something, but, uh, you know, I've watched how standards have been built in states and a lot of other things where you get something that's uh, you know built by a camel, built by a committee, and looks like a camel. Uh, and so, uh, I think that you have to be very careful about it. I'm not saying that you would abandon all committees for textbook selection. Really, as a comment on the textbook publishers more than anything else, because they're producing uh, in a with a sales mentality for that market, uh, and the teachers are choosing based on that attractive rather than necessarily <coughs> research basis. They're getting better at it. Textbook manufacturers and publishers are starting to see that under No Child Left Behind, research foundation is important. And so they learn the lessons of uh, Reading First, for example, and a lot of the uh, reading uh, programs are better, I think, now than they used to be. Uh, more integrated, more coherent, cover those five elements that are Reading First and so on. So uh, don't get me wrong about uh, textbooks and committees. I just use a caution, and if you're a superintendent or even a principal, um, be careful. Okay. I'd just like to follow up a piece yeah. of that a little bit more mm -hmm. and get into the teachers, because you mentioned with the math curriculum mm -hmm. that you and the math supervisor chose the series and for continuity from elementary mm -hmm. to middle. Right. And I know that those two particular series involve a lot of teacher professional yep, development. They, they are very, very difficult for most teachers yes, anywhere to use. Plus the fact that they weren't even part of the buy-in process. Mm -hmm. So I am curious, and then you mentioned also last night when we were talking about <coughs> teachers at the middle school level coming in without the requisite mathematics knowledge to right. begin with, which makes the problem even tougher. So I'd like to know what miracles <laughs> were, what buttons you pressed, given all of those negatives yeah. to get I will, more achievement in math. I will reaffirm you by saying I didn't have any miracles, but I had a lot of strategies, some work and some uh, didn't. Um, first of all, there's no perfect math program. Connected math isn't perfect. In fact, it was really, uh, it, it was founded on the work of Friedenthal Center in the Netherlands. And they were appalled when they saw the U.S. edition because it left out a lot of things in our math navigator program we had to put in. <coughs> you have to augment all these curricula or 
before you won't get the results you want. And the second problem is alignment with instructional capacity. I knew what I was doing, but I took a big risk um, because I knew we'd never get any farther with what we had. So I was willing to take on the challenge of professional development. It was a big challenge, and it still is. Uh, and it's a problem because this is an area where we don't very, very well work with the university model. You know, if I wanted to deepen uh, technology and math, I could send them to courses in math at the university, but that would cost a lot of money, take a lot of time, and might not even relate to the curriculum the way I might. So that doesn't solve my problem. I have to do it myself some way or another. Interestingly, in the company I'm in, that's one of the foundations of our programs, is each of our programs, we have several key unique features about our company. One of them is we believe that all of our programs should change instruction for the better as well as help students. So if you're using Mathematics Navigator, for example, you will take this back to the classroom with whatever you prefer and it will make you a much better mathematics teacher. We truly believe that and we have proof of that out there in the field. Uh, so the answers, unfortunately, are longer term answers. And what I said to my district recently when I went to visit, I said, don't just shift and change curriculum. That, you'll just start all over again on another professional development pathway. You know, you have to augment with the right things. You have to do your own professional development. The class size reduction part of it didn't help at all. We hired 2,800 teachers in my last two years. There was no, we didn't have the capacity to print 2,800 teachers in two years. I mean, we just had to do the best we could. So there's not a magic answer uh, to that alignment problem, but I didn't think the answer was staying with what we had either. Nor did I think any of the textbook programs uh, did the job. So I sought the best curriculum I thought I could get out of what was available. And investigation is a good example. They're on about their third revision. It keeps getting better. Um, and there's still places where it needs augmentation. Now, how did I deal with this problem publicly? Because those curricula had been attacked everywhere across the country. Diane Breyer is one of the brightest math people I've ever come across in Pittsburgh. And she had to give up some of this because she just couldn't fight the public. You know, these people get on the internet and they see some math professors here or there like didn't think this is crazy and blah, blah, blah. And I had that. Uh, one day I got a call from the editor of the newspaper and he said, uh, John, I'm getting a lot of questions about this connected math uh, by writing that portal. I said, are you going to be in your office in 15 minutes? He said, yeah. I said, I'll be over. So I took the books and the course and my math supervisor, we went over there and I explained the whole purpose of the curriculum. And I walked him through a few of the books and she talked to him about it. He took those books home that night and he had, and his international baccalaureate high school daughter went over all of them. Came back the next day, called me up. He said, John, looks like pretty good math curriculum to us. And that was the last I ever heard about it. I didn't have an editorial fighting me. Then I had, with investigations, I had a group of parents out at our gifted school on the beach who decided they were going to change the whole curriculum in elementary schools. They didn't like this curriculum. They were traditionally trained people, highly <coughs> educated, who weren't taught math that way themselves. And they said, no way. You know, we want the old skills approach. Let's memorize stuff. And it's not that that's not important. For example, in Japan, uh, and times tables. I think kids ought to know the times tables by the end of third grade. But in Japan, they teach you the times tables and then they say, you go home and study at home. And every Monday, you get out a sheet of paper, first part of class, and you write the times tables down. When you can do that a couple of times, then you don't have to mess with that anymore. They don't waste classroom time. I found seventh grade teachers teaching the times table. In fact, the disconnect you talked about was so bad. One day, my math supervisor was in middle school, seventh grade, I think it was, and they were teaching times tables. She said, why? You're not in the higher order math. He said, some of the kids still don't know times tables. She said, get in the higher order math and you give them a table and let them use the times table. The teacher looked at her and said, what's a table? That's how big the disconnect is. Well, in any event, uh, when I, with these teachers uh, who were trying to fight the curriculum in elementary, I took them over to another school, in fact, the one that has the DVD I gave you, and let them watch investigations taught there because I knew the problem. The big problem for superintendents is sometimes you know your teachers are the problem you can't go criticize teachers for parents. I knew the teachers really weren't into investigations. They were just playing lip service, paying lip service to it. And they went over to this, these highly educated people went over and watched being taught at another school, came back and corresponded with me immediately and said, oh wow, now we see it's not the correct it's the problem. It's awesome. Uh, these teachers need to get up to speed. They put heat on the principal, 
the, the teachers took it seriously, and that was the last I ever heard of that. So we have to do some PR work. <laughs> you know, it's it's a whole series of things that you have to do. Professional development, support what you've done, you know, <coughs> take risks. Uh, may not satisfy you entirely, but that's my answer. <laughs> I'm sticking with it. Yeah. Uh, what a, a, a superintendent has to address all the different needs within the, right. the system. Uh, what about your diverse learners, such as uh, English and Senate language, or especially uh, how was that addressed within your I had a great special ed <coughs> chief when I left. I had been a special ed person at a state level in another state. Uh, but I would tell you that I didn't do as well with special ed as I'd like to do. I think that's one of the deficiencies I left. We had not made enough progress with special ed kids. Our company focuses a lot on that because it's important built into everything we do. Uh, so I, I, I won't tell a success story with special ed uh, other than to tell you that we did invest a lot of effort in it, and, but we hadn't yet. Uh, there were some things like math that I didn't know I didn't understand misconceptions at that point, how much of a driver that was, and that helps this, it helps special ed kids a lot, really, because they tend to uh, embed these this flawed knowledge and takes it on for years and years. So uh, I didn't I don't have anything to enlighten you about what I did, only that uh, it's crucially important, sixteen percent of our population is special ed, and it's a large portion of any large urban district, Miami sixteen percent. Uh, so uh, Big challenge, and people like you are really important. <coughs> I was just wondering, what did you do for parent involvement? I know you mentioned that yeah. you send those home with the parents, and in theory, all your parents would sit down for an hour and work with their children. Yeah. Did you do that for your parents? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
what connected math was all about, why it was so different from what they had experienced themselves. So parent outreach is a crucially important part of what you have to do. And, uh, you know, then you have parents you outreach to it, whether you'd like to or not. <laughs> Other, yes? You talk about the vision, and then you said if you want the vision to be achieved, it has to be supported by teams. Right. But sometimes in the school setting, it seems that most teachers, they are more favorable for teaching rather than to be educational leaders. And then if you want to set up the teams, you need educational leaders. So how can this be achieved? My best schools call their teachers learning leaders. Mm -hmm. um, just teaching in class is a leadership challenge. I mean, that is a leadership challenge. Uh, probably in some ways more responsible than uh, a young lieutenant in the Army gets. I mean, you're responsible for a bunch of children who haven't been socialized and behavior and a lot of other things, and you're told lead them and <coughs> improve their knowledge. That, that's a big responsibility. So there is a leadership responsibility there. Getting them involved in the product of the school is about creating collaboration that gives them a sense of support so that it's, they're not isolated in the classroom feeling that they're alone trying to figure out all the answers. And so the, the, the leadership arises out of that collaboration. The principal has to be the catalyst for all of that, setting up the way that you do it, the ways that you do it, so that grade level, subject level, a coaching, all, a whole lot of support things that you can do to get teachers to feel that they're not alone. And that's basically what it is. I mean, I've talked to a lot of teachers who, when they started their teaching career years ago, they were just told, go teach, nobody ever, you know, if they got out of the university, that's it. Um, we can do a lot better than that. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, uh, what about some tutoring programs? Because I recall even my daughter bringing home math, and, you know, I could not help her, regardless right. of the degree I had. Right. Either I was doing it wrong, which she told right. me, um, <laughs> or, I mean, it was just extremely difficult, even with me being yeah. the person that I am. Were there any tutoring programs? We available? teach in mathematics, and really it applies to most subjects. You ought to use a tiered intervention program. For some kids, the regular program, whatever you're teaching, it works meet the standard, they're doing all right, you don't have to give them extra support. Then the next level down might be uh, just helping them with overcoming one obstacle in class that day. Sometimes, you know, a teacher has 25 <laughs> kids to listen in two years, and uh, just being able through formative assessment, and, and for example, the workshop model works a lot better than just straight teaching to be able to find out how those kids are doing all day, <coughs> finding out what the problem is of Johnny today so that Hey, I understand what your problem is here, and I can help you through it right now. And that's all Johnny needs to keep moving. Then you get to the next level where you need after school, before school, a tutor, some more intensive, and then you get the kids who are two years behind. Uh, they need something much deeper and go backward and work back up. So I believe in tier, I believe in tiered intervention and safety nets, starting with safety nets in the class and then extending to outside the, the bells wherever you have to. Um, the, uh, the other thing is, for example, in our company, I talked about our program, Math Navigator, we have an Indian company that has some of the most the greatest mathematicians you've ever seen who can actually, not tutor, but deliver every module of our uh, program that goes all the way to high school from third grade up. They can deliver every module over the internet with a whiteboard uh, and you get your own tutor and you put on uh, headphones. And that's if you need to augment the teaching capacity. For example, Prince George's County said, we've got 7,000 students who passed algebra and got A's, many of them, and can't pass the state test. Uh, and then they had, they're building all these students the kind of way they're teaching throughout. So among the things we had to do was bring in that kind of augmentation. They didn't have enough teachers to do the, the tutoring. And so this is more than tutoring. It's they really qualify to deliver the curriculum. It's, it's awesome. It's just people. Uh, it's intensive and it's expensive. Well, why don't we bring the uh, formal part to a close? I, I, I believe General Fryer is going to be available for those of you who still want to pursue other uh, sure. discussions with him. Yeah. And uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I hope it gave you something you can. <laughs>